Hello and welcome to the London North Centre 2015 candidate debate, the local focus on the federal election. My name is Jess Brady and I will be your moderator for today's program. We have five candidates who have joined us today to take part in our debate, but before we meet them, let's learn a little bit more about the riding they hope to represent in the House of Commons. London North Centre is a compact riding at only 59 square kilometres, but there is a lot packed into that space. Nestled between Wonderland, Highbury and the Thames River, the Northern Riding takes in many significant landmarks such as Western University, two major hospitals and the downtown core. The Riding was created in 1996 as London Adelaide but was renamed London North Centre in 1997. The Riding is densely populated with 117,000 residents and close to 95,000 of them are eligible voters. The average family's after-tax income is nearly $72,000. From 1997 to 2006, the riding was held by the Liberals and represented by former Mayor Joe Fontana, followed by Glenn Pearson, who lost in the 2011 election to Conservative Susan Troupe, who was seeking re-election. Rogers TV, the local focus on the federal election. Now that we've learned all about the riding of London North Centre, let's meet our candidates. Starting at this end of the table, we have Liberal candidate Peter Fragicajos, and next we have NDP candidate Roman Gutierrez. Incumbent MP representing the Conservative Party of Canada, Susan Troupe, running for the Libertarian Party, we have Ryan Basson and running for the Green Party, Carol Dick. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate you taking part. So before we get going, we're just going to take a moment to explain the format of today's debate. Each candidate will have one minute to make an opening statement to introduce themselves. Then they will have one minute to answer each of the pre-recorded questions from members of the London media. Rebuttals will be allowed at my discretion and candidates will have 30 seconds to reply. Each person will also have an opportunity to make a closing statement. We want to hear what you think about this debate as we move through it. So please make sure that you're logging on to Twitter and you can use the hashtag hashtag RTV local campaign. If you're looking for more information about our debate series, go to our local campaign page at rogerstv.com. Information about the election itself can be found on Election Canada's site at elections.ca. All of that information will also scroll on the screen throughout the debate. Now, without further ado, let's begin our debate. Our candidates drew for their response order. Peter, with the Liberals, you are up first, so you have one minute to begin your opening statement. Thanks very much, Jess. Uh, my name is Peter Fregascados. I'm your federal liberal candidate in London North Centre. First of all, I want you to know why I'm doing this. Why have I decided to put my name on the ballot? And the reason is, this community matters to me. This country matters to me. My family fled civil war and poverty in Greece in the 1950s and 60s. They settled in Canada. They came to London. London gave them a second chance. And so I want to give back. I've tried to do that through my professional work as a political scientist at King's University College. I've tried to do it through my community work, uh, assisting uh, various charities as a board member and a volunteer throughout the city. But I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm dissatisfied. Uh, this country could be doing so much better. This city could be doing so much better. Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party have a plan for real change, a plan that's focused on growing the middle class, on growing our economy, and helping those who are joining the, the economy who are working hard to join the middle class. Uh, we All right, this is our opening statement from Peter with the Liberal Party, Herman Gutierrez for the NDP. My fellow Londoners, I am Herman Gutierrez and I'm your NDP candidate in London North Centre. I'm a journalist and an educator. My family and I have lived in London with many of the same challenges that you have now. Today I'm asking for your support helping New Democrats fight for the rights of all Canadians. As a New Democrat, I believe everyone deserves to live with dignity. And unfortunately, the current government has consistently made deep cuts to the very essentials of dignified living. One truth we need to address is that there is a growing inequality that has weakened the middle class and reduced its contributions to our economic growth. We need a progressive tax system and federal funding that can reinvigorate the middle class, create jobs, protect the environment, and guard our seniors who have mm -hmm. been giving the very best of their lives to make this country great. The real change we need is a new democracy, and on October 19, you have the power to bring it. Together, we can make a better Canada. Thank you very much. We'll move to Susan Troupe of the Conservative Party. 
Thanks, Jess. This election is about the economy and our country's security. It is about who is best to lead Canada. Over the last two elections, our Conservative government has guided Canada through the worst global recession since the 1930s. We have cut taxes over 200 times for families, seniors and businesses. We have balanced the budget by eliminating wasteful spending and without cutting transfers to persons or other levels of government. As a result, Canada has one of the strongest job creation records in the G7 since the depth of the recession. But Canada is not immune to global economic uncertainty from places like Europe or China. In these challenging economic times, we need a Prime Minister with a proven experience to lead a $1.9 trillion economy, not the risky high-tax, high-debt proposals of the opposition parties. My name is Susan Truppe and I'm honoured to have been the Member of Parliament for the last four years and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you very much. We'll go now to our Libertarian candidate, Ryan Basson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ryan Basson and I'm the candidate with the Libertarian Party of Canada. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to be here and I think what is needed is to inject some different perspectives and maybe some new ideas into the political sphere. Uh, firstly, the Libertarian Party is the party that believes the, the best per person to steward your life is yourself and we believe government's role is to protect and uh, create the situations for people to be able to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll go to our Green Party candidate, Carol Dick. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Dick, your Green Party candidate for London North Centre. With this election, Canadians can take the steps towards reinvigorating our nation. For too long, Canadians have been presented with a false dichotomy that they must choose between the environment and the economy. But that is false. Canada can and should have a strong economy and a healthy environment. By over-relying on primary resources, Canada is missing out on opportunities to advance its research and development and to create value-added jobs which would help alleviate the chronic underemployment of our youth. In 15 years when the chil my children enter the workforce, I want them to feel optimistic about their employment opportunities in Canada, but I want that for all Canadians, especially here in London. It's a time now to have bold ideas, one that would involve a national housing strategy, a national energy strategy, and others. I am new to politics, but I can bring a lot with my energy, enthusiasm, and extensive knowledge of the issues, and I hope that you'll please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our candidates for your opening statements. We'll now move on to our first question of the debate, and it has to do with the economy. Canada's oil and gas sectors have been hit hard in recent months, with lower prices sending shockwaves through the country's economy. In the face of such a downturn, how would your party strive to diversify the Canadian economy to make it less vulnerable to such upsets? And our first reply will come from Herman Gutierrez of the NDP. Thank you. With the NDP, we have a very concrete plan to uh, basically address the key core issue, and that is that our middle class is struggling. There's no such thing as a strong middle class any longer in Canada. We need to defend our middle class and foster new employment opportunities. We've lost thousands, not thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs. There are not thousands, not tens of thousands, but millions of people that are looking to provide and to participate in the economy, but we have led them out of it. If we strengthen our economy by promoting middle class work that will settle back into a strong economy immediately, the problem that we have had with our high inequality going on with unattended is that the people who could contribute to strengthen the economy, that is our middle class, have fallen out of the GDP. There is no contribution by the middle class. Thank you very much. On to Susan Truppe of the Conservative Party. Thank you. Canada has the best job creation record in the G7 and the lowest real GDP growth since the recession. We've created 1.3 million net new jobs. These are good, full-time, good-paying jobs. Look, we've seen that the external issues can cause instability, like China and oil, just to name a few. We've just announced the Home Renovation Tax Credit, which will be permanent, and the First Time Home Buyers Plan. This will help families and will create jobs. Stephen Harper is on the right track and has been since the recession. He is the leader that we can trust to do what is best for the economy. The opposition has said that they will increase taxes and create billions of debt. It is the worst thing that a government could do in a fragile economy, and although Justin thinks we can grow the economy from the heart outwards, it doesn't work that way. Thank you very much. Ryan Basson of the Libertarian Party. Well, a recent study showed that the average uh, Canadian household spends more on taxes than they do on housing and food alone. 
so <clears throat> one of the one of the problems is is that with the high tax burden on the middle class that they are unable to afford and stimulate the economy which would otherwise be possible uh, things like the the oil sands and all the oil investment that has been done by government has proven to be a problem since they, had, they don't have the ability to make those investments uh, in, in, a, in a proper way. And this has resulted in what we've seen now. The, the huge corporate welfare has allowed this, uh, the oil industry essentially to have taxpayers have their money invested and the money lost. We believe that the best thing to do would be to leave the money in the hands of the citizens since they are best able to make these decisions and to decide where their, their money should go. Thank you very much. Carol Dick of the Green Party. Uh, hello. So one of the things we think that should happen is that we should diversify the, uh, our portfolio, our energy portfolio. So instead of uh, continuing to export raw resources, particularly Dilbit, we could start processing it within the country in an environmentally sustainable way. That will bring a lot more permanent jobs to the nation. Another thing that ne we need to look at is having a national child care policy. We have a lot of resources that are going to waste when you have women that, particularly women, but in some cases men, that are unable to enter the workforce because they can't afford child care. If we can start mobilizing these resources, it will bring a lot to our economy and start sending it forward. And lastly, I think there needs to be a lot more um, insertion of resources into research and development to create green infrastructure and new jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll now go to our Liberal candidate, Peter Fragascados, for his reply. Well, we can't blame everything on external events. Certainly external events matter, uh, but we're in another recession here, and that's because the Harper government has failed to invest in this country. Uh, a Liberal government would certainly not raise taxes. What we would do is look at developing the economy by investing in its people and its infrastructure. Uh, we believe in growing the economy uh, that way. Uh, if you invest in infrastructure, you will get this economy going again. At a time when interest rates are at historic lows, we have to do something differently. A Liberal government would devote $120 billion to fund improvements in roads, bridges, bridges excuse me, transit networks, the, the building of uh, seniors' facilities, child care facilities. All of these things will generate jobs and lead to the circumstances where you can create uh, more economic growth that leads to a balanced budget. Uh, that's the Liberal plan. We're going to focus on middle class families and not raise their taxes. Okay, we'll move on to our second question now and that comes from Sean Meyer of Our London. What will your party do to revitalize the manufacturing sector in both London and southwestern Ontario? Okay, and the first reply goes to Susan Troupe of the Conservative Party. Thank you, Jess. We know that the Canadian manufacturing industry and its workers are one of the key engines of Canada's economy. We have supported billions of dollars in tax relief for new manufacturing machinery and equipment. We've invested millions in the automotive innovation and a billion in support of Canada's aerospace industry. These initiatives continue to support jobs, unlike the Liberals and NDP who want to raise taxes on individuals, businesses and payroll taxes. This will hurt our economy and will kill jobs. Okay, thank you very much. Ryan Besson of the Libertarian Party. Well, firstly, the Libertarian view is that the best place to make a decision is the people that are actually involved in the area and that know what is needed for that specific situation. As such, we believe that a, a someone as, a, as part of the federal government is less able to make that decision that's very specific to that local area. So the strategy that we would advocate would be to leave that power and uh, put as little as burden as possible on the, the local area from the federal government and allow the local government or the local city councils to make the, the best decisions and, and how to spend their money. Okay, and Carol Dick? I think that uh, we should invest more in education for jobs in the manufacturing sector and that includes providing opportunities for those that are disadvantaged and don't have access to um, ac education, um, particularly minorities and some women. In that case, uh, we can have more people available to provide work. At the same time, we need to encourage industries to come in. There's been a number of industries that have shut down in London. We need to find ways to bring investment so that those factories can open up again and perhaps not create a different uh, product, perhaps a, perhaps a green product, maybe um, green energy uh, products or things like that. Okay, thank you. Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Well, 
first of all, we, were, we are not going to raise taxes on uh, middle class individuals, certainly not. The only group that would face a tax increase uh, are those 1% of people earning $200,000 or more a year uh, under a liberal plan. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mulcair and Mr. Harper would keep their tax levels uh, the same. Uh, what we are looking at is a situation in manufacturing where most people are in the, most of the employees in that sector are in the middle class. We need to get that sector going again by investing in infrastructure. Uh, with improved uh, road networks, uh, with improved transit networks, we see less congestion, and that helps get goods to market. Under Mr. Harper, uh, we have failed uh, the manufacturing sector in London. Uh, Electromotive diesel, Ford, Kellogg's. Uh, we will spend, again, $125 billion over 10 years to get this economy going again. Interest rates are at historic lows. The manufacturing sector deserves a better uh, network to, uh, to export uh, its goods. Okay, Herman Gutierrez from the NDP. You, we must remember that London, Ontario was the second hardest hit city after the 2008 recession. We lost thousands of jobs and this was a manufacturing city. So we need to, put, to, to come back to London and see how after so many years, why we have not recovered. Now, we have not recovered because there has not been an investment from the federal government in our municipal reality. Our federal government has taken a step back. We have a $172 billion deficit that is riding on the back of our cities in Canada. In the specific case of London, Ontario, we need to reinvent our city around those things that we do better so that, and for that purpose, we need to reinvest from the federal government. We need to be able to alleviate the taxes that the city is, uh, has to put up with here. 60% of the gasoline tax that Thank you very much. Our next question now is from Deborah Van Brank from the London Free Press. Job losses in this region have totaled tens of thousands. Name one thing that you would do to retain or regain jobs. And our first answer will come from Ryan Besson of the Libertarian Party. Well, I think London is definitely a, a hub for technology. Uh, one of the things we can do is definitely look to ease up on any regulations that would allow the expansion and the creation of more jobs. Uh, it's, it's been shown that the strongest economies are not the economies with the biggest business or the most business, but the most new business. So anything we can do to get government regulation that, that hinders the creation of these new businesses, whether that be uh, uh, the business cost, the actual cost of the business uh, license, or whether that be just taxes on the business, anything that we can look at where government hinders these, these issues and where we can get government out of the way to allow people to come up with uh, these creative uh, solutions to problems, uh, especially in London's uh, technologically rich environment with a huge student resource. We believe that focusing on getting these students into the creation of their new business and bringing their ideas forward is what we should be looking at. Okay, Carol Dick of the Greens. Okay, there are two uh, ideas that I can think of right now. Elizabeth May just put forth her platform on the housing strategy. In this area alone, she talks about how we can upgrade all of Canada's infrastructure, including our homes. This will create lots of jobs for carpenters, plumbers, electricians. In this way, we can really revitalize the economy and bring a lot of jobs. The other way uh, would be to uh, invest in more education for the for the youth and provide jobs for them so that they can, uh, you know, uh, as uh, my colleague here said, come up with new ideas, new innovations, new products, and create small businesses that can be productive in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. On to Peter Fragiscados of the Liberals. Well, economic growth depends on investing, again, in people, investing in our infrastructure. When we do that, we see benefits not just for those in the construction sector who are involved in making the improvements in roads, in bridges, bridges excuse me, in transit networks, uh, all of those things. Uh, but the spin-off uh, effect of that, that will help London. Uh, beyond that, we have to recognize that we live in a knowledge-based economy. We have to invest in research and innovation, and that's how we can get our manufacturing sector going again. When that happens, advanced manufacturing uh, can be discussed in a serious way. It's not being discussed right now. Okay, to Herman Gutierrez of the NDP. Well, 
if we take into account that there are 1.3 million unemployed people and that 400,000 manufacturing jobs, good jobs, have been lost in Canada, it stands to reason that we invest in the middle class by cutting small business taxes from 11 to 9 percent, that is the NDP plan, and that will of course promote a reinvestment of the small business. And as small businesses grow, so will the economy and we'll be able to get back those good, healthy jobs that will boost the performance of our economic numbers here in London North Centre. Susan Truppe of the Conservative Party. Thank you. I'd just like to reiterate that uh, one of the new, or a couple of the new initiatives that were uh, just announced by Stephen Harper was the Home Renovation Tax Credit and the First Time Home Buyers Plan. Uh, that will certainly help create jobs in London and all across Canada. We also have the Permanent Gas Tax Fund that uh, the Prime Minister made permanent so that uh, peop or cities like London can can uh, fix their roads and bridges and again that creates jobs. We also have had many infrastructure announcements here in London and I'm sure there'll be more coming forward and certainly I would uh, be, be advocating on behalf of, of the uh, businesses in London and, and the city. The other thing I just wanted to mention too was um, it was our government that cut the GST and we also have um, um, corporate tax initiatives that we're reducing uh, to help businesses and we haven't increased our taxes in over 200 times. But what won't help is that high taxes and high debt will not be good for a fragile economy. Thank you very much. And now a topic that a few of our candidates here have touched upon uh, would be infrastructure and things of that nature. It ties in quite well with our next question from Devin Peacock of AM980. London is currently in the process of upgrading its transit system with some form of rapid transit. If your party is elected, what will you do to help provide funding? And our first respondent is Carol Dick. Yes, uh, the Green Party is for rapid transit, public transit. We need to increase this infrastructure. We cannot continue to be reliant on cars uh, in the future. There is going to be uh, possibly shortages in oil, there's going to be continuing climate change and air pollution, so we need to put funds directly into a public transit system and a rapid transit system. And at the same time, we have to encourage um, more biking within our city and create good, safe bike routes so that we can take more of the cars off the road. These would be plans we'd put forward. Thank you. Okay, Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Well, uh, transit and investing in transit is very important. It's very important to me. Uh, and it's very important to our party. Uh, when you invest in transit, you're investing in the economy because uh, congestion cuts down on economic productivity. Uh, my opponents uh, in the NDP would not invest in transit because there's cuts coming with a mall care government. We know that. That's how they're going to take care of uh, their pledge to balance the budget. And I know that uh, stakeholders in this community that have asked for the Conservatives to be at the table to talk about uh, helping the transit sector have been ignored. Uh, and this is happening on a national level, but it's happening on a local level as well. We need someone in Ottawa, we need a representative in Ottawa, who will work with municipal councillors to make transit happen in this city. Real transit reform. Okay, our next reply from Herman Gutierrez. Infrastructure backlog is growing and billions in investment are needed to keep up with the demand. With Mulcair's Better Transit Plan, we'll ensure that vital infrastructure is there when needed by giving one additional cent of the existing gas tax to municipalities, ramping up to an additional $1.5 billion and increasingly, su increasing subsequently to $3.7 billion in transparent public transit investment over the next 20 years. Okay, to our Conservative candidate, Susan Truppe. Thank you. I've been very supportive of, pro of uh, transit projects and will continue to be. Our government is making strategic investments in public transit infrastructure to help reduce gridlock and congestion, which is very important in many busy cities. $70 billion over 10 years will support Canadian projects and create jobs. An application hasn't been submitted by the city yet, but when it is, I'll certainly look at it and we will do our due diligence once uh, it is in. In terms of right now, though, the most important thing that people have is a job. And if the NDP and Liberals raise taxes as they promised, that may be difficult and could kill jobs in this fragile economy. 
Thank you very much. We'll go to Ryan Besson of the Liberal Libertarian Party. Excuse me. <laughs> well, I, I think it's great that you know people were looking at these other alternatives and maybe finding a more efficient ways of transport to cut down both on emissions. You know, try and care for the environment and try and try and stimulate uh, uh, easier easier uh, commutes. Uh, I think we should also. I I'd, I'd much rather focus uh, my attentions on promoting things like uh, Uber and using, uh, uh, transitioning over to the sharing economy where we can uh, provide these transport solutions in a way that benefits everyone and share it amongst people. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on now to our next question from Andrew Lawton of AM980. With a lot of Canadians very unhappy about the state of affairs in the Senate and several democracy-related uh, criminal charges levied against people involved in politics in recent years, do you feel Canadian democracy is working? If not, what changes do you think are necessary so that Canadians can be more assured of their government working for them? For our first reply, we'll go to Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Uh, the Liberal Party is committed to fair and open government. Uh, under Mr. Harper, uh, we have seen a situation where he appointed no less than 59 senators. Uh, that includes Mike Duffy, that includes Pamela Wallen, that includes Patrick Brousseau. Uh, we believe that it's time for a different approach. You can't simply abolish the Senate as Mr. Mulcair would have you believe. You need provincial consent, unanimity in fact, to make that happen. The Supreme Court has ruled on it. We want a non-partisan appointment process based uh, on the model of the uh, Order of Canada appointments, the su uh, Supreme Court uh, justices appointments. That's real change. Uh, I also want to say that we are committed to real electoral reform. 18 months uh, after uh, being elected within that period, uh, we will uh, commit to real e electoral reform to make the system more fair. It's not fair right now. Thank you very much. We'll go to Herman Gutierrez. Only Tom Mulcair and the NDP have committed clearly to introducing a form of proportional representation to fix the things that are happening that are wrong with our democracy. It's a clear stance. There are many forms of proportional representation. One has got to be discussed. And with the many scandals that uh, we have been uh, seeing in Canada, the one thing that cannot happen that we need to be aware of is that we cannot have a marriage between absolute corruption and total impunity. So yes, we need to modify our democracy and, the, uh, and we need to do it urgently. That is why we need to abolish the Senate, and yes, there are ways of doing it. Thank you very much. To Susan Trupe now with the Conservatives. Thank you. It's kind of a two-part question, um, so we'll start with the first part. The Prime Minister has been very clear that Canadians should have a say in any proposed changes to the voting system. What the opposition parties are doing is proposing to ram through changes for partisan reasons and without allowing the people to vote. Not allowing the people to vote is very wrong. In terms of the Senate, our party believes that the Senate needs to be significantly reformed, including term limits and elected senators. The Supreme Court has ruled, saying that these changes would have to meet the constitutional formula of a majority of the provinces and with the majority of the population. The provinces have been all over the map on this, and uh, we've asked them to start working on this towards uh, building a consensus. And what the, opposi what the opposition parties are doing is either promising what they can't deliver or delivering something that won't address the problem. Thank you very much. On to Ryan Basson of the Libertarian Party. Well, I definitely believe that, that we do have an issue with uh, the accountability towards politicians, uh, especially in the Senate. And uh, any unelected position should definitely be scrutinized and looked at, at finding ways of making sure that the Canadian public has some kind of uh, more direct uh, way of providing feedback on how they are doing and, and be able to hold uh, these people accountable. Okay, Carol Dick of the Greens. The Green Party supports proportional voting. At the moment, we have very low voter turnout, particularly in the last election. And this is because a lot of Canadians do not feel that their vote counts. They worry that it's going to be lost and they have to deal with strategic voting. In this case, if it was proportional voting, Canadians would feel that they would actually have those people representing them and their interests represented in the Parliament. In regards to the Senate, there needs to be some form of reform. One way to do this would be to have an independent uh, committee look at the Senate, interview Canadians, find out how they feel about the Senate, it, Senate and what changes they'd like to see, and then carry forward a referendum to bring these changes, either whether it would be abolished whether there or whether there would be changes. And finally, there needs to be more discussion 
Um, there was a lot of uh, bills that have recently have been passed that Canadians were not consulted on. There should be more consultation before these bills go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next question now from Pat Maloney of London Free Press. Is Stephen Harper's oft-repeated reference to the looming terror threat facing Canadians unreasonable, or do you think there is indeed a threat facing Canadians and Londoners? Our first reply comes from Herman Gutierrez. Threats are something that uh, in our Canadian society are, some, are taken care of by the police and the military and they are perfectly capable of doing so without the need for a policing bill or to create a, pol a, st a policing state. Tom Mulcair has clearly said we will repeal Bill C-51. We cannot afford an attack on our rights and freedoms on the supposed or uh, alleged idea that we are, at, by that same token, defending ourselves from terrorism. There is no such thing. We cannot have uh, a, a, a so support the Anti-Terrorist Act and sacrifice our rights and freedoms. We will not stand for it. We will, and we are the only party that has promised to repeal Bill C-51. Susan Trupe of the Conservatives. Thank you. Look, we're not immune from terrorism and we must be vigilant against those who want to harm us. I'm sure some of you will remember the Toronto 18, the, the group that also wanted to blow up via rail. There was a, a group of four, four, four kids from London that went over to fight uh, w with the terrorists. But let me tell you a story. On October 22nd, I was the one at sitting at this table that was in the House of Commons in, the, in, our, in our caucus room when a lone terrorist gunman stormed the center block killed Corporal Carrillo just before storming the block and we were all inside, the, we were inside our caucus room, all the parties were, and we were all very frightened. All we could hear was 60 to 100 rounds of gunfire outside our room. Once we heard that we, we ran to different areas in the room, there wasn't a lot of places to run, but for, for the good fortune of, our, of the former RCMP and other officers, they barricaded the doors and they used the uh, flagpoles as weapons should anyone enter the room. The terrorist that did that was shot dead by, by Kevin Vickers, our sergeant at arms. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our libertarian candidate, Ryan Besson. Well, we are told that uh, we're being attacked for our freedoms, so I definitely think the solution is not to remove our freedoms. Uh, civil liberties matter a lot. Any society that is willing to lose civil liberties for, in the, for the name of security will receive neither. Uh, the threats posed by terrorists are minimal. Your, your chances of getting struck by, by lightning is higher. The chances of being killed by a moose are higher. Uh, what we believe is that you know, the troops should not be fighting over there. We know from, from what we've seen from experience and, and from what empirical evidence has shown us that fighting over in the Middle East does not do anything. It doesn't improve the terrorist attacks. And Bill C-51, if we were to look at a similar bill that was passed, the Patriot Act, to, in our, uh, with, uh, with our neighbors to the south, no, it has not proven to be effective at all in reducing uh, or, or finding out, uh, uh, scoping out terrorist threats. Uh, we believe that the best thing to do is just to be vigilant and make sure that we bring the troops home to protect us here. Thank you very much. On to Carol Dick. We cannot deny that there is a terrorist threat. We have just listened to Susan Trupe talk about her experience at the House of Commons. However, we must remember that there have been way fewer people killed from terrorism in Canada than there have been First Nations and Aboriginal women that have gone missing or have been killed. And so it seems that more resources should be put towards solving that problem, finding out what's happened with them, than beefing up our security and uh, in, uh, instituting rather draconian bills that go after our privacy and make a two-tier ci uh, citizenship within Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. On to Peter Fragascatos of the Liberals. Is terrorism a problem? Of course it is. Of course terrorism is, a, is a, uh, an issue that we all need to be concerned about, especially those who are seeking public office. Uh, the Liberal Party is committed to making sure that Canadians are safe. What I would question, though, is our combat mission in Iraq right now. It's not clear that the combat mission is stemming the uh, um, spread of ISIS and stemming their power in any meaningful way. Uh, we need to uh, think back to our role in world affairs traditionally. Uh, we've always brought people together. 
let's do that now. As far as Iraq goes, uh, there are elements in Iraq that need, uh, that need aid uh, and need uh, advice. Elements within the Iraqi military, uh, the Kurdish Peshmerga, uh, the Shia groups that want to uh, make Iraq work. Uh, if that happens, uh, groups like ISIS can be defeated, but a combat mission does not do that. Uh, what I would also add is that we are committed to repealing the sections of uh, C-51 that are public. we'll have to cut it right there. So sorry. Uh, next question from Craig Needles from AM980. Discussions about marijuana surrounding this campaign have been very prevalent as well. Decriminalization, legalization, leave things the way they are. Where does your party stand on the marijuana issue? All right. And for our first reply, we go to Susan Trufe of the Conservative Party. Thank you. Our party, our party stands on the fact that marijuana is harmful to children and, and, and to Canadians. Studies have been proven that it's harmful and we are looking at other things. We, we have a national drug strategy and uh, we are committed to keeping Canadians safe and we do not believe that marijuana is the way to do that like the other parties are advocating for. Thank you very much. On to Ryan Basson of the Libertarians. Well, I think we should be looking at more progressive strategies such as those implemented in Portugal, which have shown that the legalization of all, of all drugs um, has, has led and just changing the way in which we look to solve these problems. Rather than making it a criminal issue, we look at the healthcare aspect of it. How, how can we help people rather than uh, locking them up and pretending that that is somehow going to help them improve their situation. But furthermore, I think we could also, uh, um, you know, look at what benefits could be brought from ending prohibition, whether that's the, the economic benefits from the hemp sector or, as seen in Colorado, the increased revenue from, uh, from the, uh, the opening of the industry. I think these are all useful, useful uh, tools to help us change the way that we currently approach the topic. Thank you very much. Carol Dick of the Greens. Uh, we believe that marijuana should be legalized. There are many medicinal benefits for marijuana that can help people with multiple sclerosis, to deal with epilepsy, and to deal with cancer and pain. It is clogging our uh, court system to have all these cases going through with marijuana. We could actually use marijuana to our benefit as a product that could be exported. We could use it for hemp production. There is a lot that could be done with marijuana and it should be legalized. Thank you very much. Peter Fragicavs from the Liberals. Uh, marijuana legalization is not, is not at the top of the priority list for the Liberal Party. However, we believe that the status quo is not working. Uh, we want to take an evidence-based approach on this issue. Uh, police resources are being tied up. Uh, and we know that the status quo uh, enriches organized crime. Uh, we have to keep drugs out of the hands of our children. We have to keep our neighborhoods safe. Uh, the situation as it exists now does not make that so. Uh, legalizing it, taxing it, regulating it, takes it out of the hands, takes marijuana out of the hands of drug dealers, and again, keeps our streets safer and saves us money. Uh, we're uh, spending $500 million since 2006 um, uh, prosecuting those who have marijuana offenses. Uh, that's simply unacceptable. Resources need to be used in a better, more effective way. To Herman Gutierrez of the NDP. It has been documented for many years that uh, in those countries that produce illegal drugs and uh, thus foster very multi-billionaire uh, businesses, uh, doing something about legalization automatically fixes, lowers the problem. We will legalize marijuana. I think it's something that we can do. We should put the protections in place to keep our society uh, free of harm and in terms of education and health. We can do that, but by legalizing the issue, you take it away from the hands of the drug dealers and the multi-billion dollar businesses that uh, are going underground. Once they are taxed and legalized, the problem seems to be taken care of. Thank you very much. We are now moving into our last question of the debate. comes from Jana Casey. She is a representative with the London Youth Advisory Council. What do you believe is the most important environmental issue that needs to be addressed currently, and how will you tackle it? Thank you for that. And we will go to Ryan Basson of the Libertarian Party for our first reply on that question. 
Well, I absolutely believe that it's uh, very important to address the environmental concerns that we have. Uh, three things that I see that we can do in order to facilitate uh, the solution for this, uh, for this problem is number one is ending corporate welfare. Any and all industries uh, that are involved in the energy sector should, should be able to compete on their own in the market and play on equal footing with everyone else. They should not be reliant on government assistance. Secondly, I believe that we should uh, look at enforcing stronger property rights. So to allow people the ability to have recourse for damages that can be done uh, you know from oil spills or, or any kind of adverse effects uh, thirdly I believe we should look at anything that we can do to remove the regulations that prohibit the, the creation of new uh, new green energy sources you know such as such as the import tariffs uh, if you look at things like what Tesla is doing you know with a home battery uh, we need to look how can we how can we f facilitate the creation and uh, purchase, uh, bring down the prices of these products. Thank you very much to Carol Dick of the Greens. This is a topic of extreme importance and interest to me and I have many ways in which I feel that we could improve Canada's environmental record. Firstly, I really feel that we need to improve the protection of our marine environment. We have the longest coastline in the world and only 1% of our marine environment is protected at the moment. We must safeguard that environment for our fishing industry, but also just for the intrinsic beauty of those oceans. We must also work to protect our Arctic area, which is currently under threat because of climate change, but also increased shipping due to the sea melting and the uh, navigable, navigable <laughs> uh, pathway through the north. And then finally, we need to improve the protection that we have on Canada's rivers and lakes with the Navigation Act. 98% of that area is no longer protected. And then overarching all of this, we must tackle climate change and we must return to Kyoto. Thank you. Thank you very much to Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Well, this is a very important issue. It speaks to the kind of uh, Canada we want to see and the kind of Canada we want to pass, uh, pass along to future generations. Uh, the economy and the environment can't be separated. They are interconnected. You can't have a strong uh, economy without a strong environment and vice versa. Uh, what we believe is that uh, global warming and climate change need to be taken seriously. Uh, we would work towards uh, a different approach uh, than Mr. Harper and the Conservatives. Uh, an approach that would actually engage our international par partners to deal with carbon emissions, an approach that would work with provincial uh, premiers to make that happen as well uh, for, uh, for local solutions. Each province will have its own approach that it wants to uh, put in place. Uh, on top of that, we will invest in clean technologies. Uh, we need to, need to look at things like solar technology. We have a company here in London, Canadian Solar, that needs to be supported. Uh, our party is committed to doing that, and when we do that, we support good paying uh, jobs for Londoners. Thank you very much to Herman Gutierrez. So we need to grow our economy and at the same time protect our environment while addressing the issue of high inequality and meeting our climate commitments. In the last decade, laws protecting air, land and water have been dismantled and billions were given in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. After signing our Kyoto Protocol, rather than diminishing our emissions, Canada's went up by 34%. We need to transition to a clean economy, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, and look for alternate ways to grow our economy in alliance with our environment. Thank you very much to Conservative Representative Susan Troupe. Environmental issues are important to Canada and our government has been working on, on in the environment uh, portfolio since we were elected. We've invested hundreds of millions in initiatives to keep our air clean, our water clean and our land clean and we're going to continue to do that. We've also created the most nationally protected parkland of any government in Canadian history. But what I'm hearing at the doors is that people want a balanced approach on both the environment and protecting the economy and jobs and the opposition parties don't get that. I do agree with them that they said the economy needs to be good, but the economy won't be good with their high tax agenda and high debt agenda in this fragile economy. Thank you very much. And now we go to our next question from Asala Eladel of the London Youth Advisory Council. Youth between the ages of 18 to 34 are more involved in community activities than adults in nearly all aspects except formal politics. How would you improve youth engagement and make formal politics more appealing to youth? And we'll be starting with Carol Dick of the Greens. 
Well, first, I think that uh, the politicians and the uh, groups, in the political groups, need to have more of a presence on campuses and in, um, in schools. If we can start having more clubs, more times when we can engage and ask questions of the youth, see what their um, issues are, what is important to them, that would be fantastic. And we do need to acknowledge that we do have a youth that is very involved in volunteering and social programs and, and things like that. And we need to continue to encourage that because it is such a good thing for our country. Thank you very much. We'll go to Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Well, here's how I would uh, engage youth in our community. I would actually go out and speak to them. I I've already spoken to some of our youth counselors about ways that this city can move forward, issues that matter to them. And this is a very important issue to me. Uh, I'm, as I mentioned before, a political scientist at King's College. Uh, I've sat with students. I've heard their concerns about the future, concerns about jobs, concerns about tuition. Uh, all of that is it's part of the reason that I'm running. It's, it, goes, it speaks to the core of why I'm a candidate here. Uh, youth matter. Uh, when youth do well, our country does well. Uh, as far as uh, the liberal policy on this, uh, our, uh, our party is committed to uh, uh, engaging youth. A youth advisory uh, committee would, allow, would be uh, able to uh, consult uh, the prime minister. Uh, something like that isn't happening now. And if we're going to move forward as a, as a country, we have to reach out to young people and listen to what they have to say. They matter. Youth voices matter, and we have to understand that. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Right at the bell, Herman Gutierrez. I hear from my students, and, and I speak with my students every day, and what I hear from them is that they are afraid with their increasing debt. When they leave university or college, they will be up to their ears in debt and they will not have access, immediate access, to a good, healthy job. That kind of fear has to be stayed. So one of the things that we can do for our youth is getting them involved in what is theirs. They are the future of our nation. The moment that they step up and they say, okay, let's work for me now. This is my future, this is my country, and that is my invitation. Our youth matter to the point that it is in their hands to change this country by making key decisions and key apportations to our democracy. And my invitation is open. We need to engage and listen to you. Nobody is doing that. We will. Thank you very much. Susan Trupe of the Conservatives. Thank you, and I'm very happy that the youth are very involved in the community. There are so many great organizations in London North Centre that really need your help. Our government is very supportive of youth and always have been. We invest over $330 million a year in one program, just for example, called the, the Youth Employment Strategy Program, or what we refer to it as YES. It's a great program. It gives uh, youth the skills and opportunities to gain employment. And I've spoken to many youth in my last four and a half years, and what is the concern to them is jobs. They want the tools they need to get a job. And the opposition parties want to raise taxes on individuals and businesses that will kill jobs. You cannot raise taxes on families and businesses. It's the worst thing you can do during a fragile economy. Thank you very much. We go to Ryan Besson. Well, that's the primary reason I am here, is because I feel that our generation is lacking a voice in politics. Uh, we don't feel that we have the ability to have our opinions heard or our ideas heard. Uh, I think the, the thing that we need to address is more so than who is in charge, is how does the system work. We need to fundamentally examine how, how things are put together through the various levels of government and why our voices aren't heard. The higher it goes up through the different levels of government, the less we are heard. So the fundamental thing that I believe we should be doing is trying to look at that process and seeing what we can do to make politics more readily accessible, uh, be it via technology, by improved uh, communication, or whatever means necessary. And that's the, the one hope I have to, to bring out of this, uh, or with me, uh, with this uh, disappearance. Thank you very much. And now we're going from one topic that has played largely in the campaign in, in, in some respects in talking about youth and engagement. Uh, and we'll go to another topic that has been discussed quite a bit is uh, women's issues. And so for that, we will go to Devin Peacock from AM 980. If your party forms the next government, what will you do to help improve the lives of Canadian women? And for our first response, we go to Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. Well, when we look at a situation where in Canada there are many, so many different women's issues, uh, we have to look at pressing matters and matters that are, are causing so much distress. 
uh, the situation with First Nations women, murdered and missing First Nations women, is needs to be at the top of the agenda when it comes to uh, addressing the concerns of vulnerable women. Uh, when more than 1,500 women disappear, we have to ask why. We have to ask why. This is not simply a matter of uh, a criminal justice issue. Uh, this is not uh, something that, uh, that can, can be dealt with in that way. Uh, Mr. Harper has said that women uh, in First Nations communities who have uh, been abandoned in this way, uh, th they're not on his radar. Uh, that, needs to, that needs to be overturned. We need a public inquiry. We need that immediately. We also need to invest in women again. Uh, so much funding has been cut from women's organizations. That's not right. Thank you. On to Herman Gutierrez of the NDP. In our country, there, we need more women at all levels. We need more women in government. We need more women in the industry. We need more women in finance and in all levels of research and social investigation. We have women in those sectors, but they are underpaid. The money that they make is not the same that their male counterparts make for the same positions. We need to fix that. That is called inequality. We need to abolish inequality. We also need to protect women. There are many women in our country who are living in homes away from their home because they're seeking protection away from family violence. We cannot afford that. We need to put all those protections in place, and we will with an NDP mandate. Thank you to Conservative Representative Susan Troupe. Thank you. Well, I'm so proud that the Prime Minister appointed me as Parliamentary Secretary for Status of Women. And, and, and our, our funding for Status of Women is at the highest level ever. Over the last mandate, we were proud to announce millions of funding to prevent violence against women and girls, millions for projects that encourage women in leadership and decision-making roles, millions for projects that promote economic security, for example, projects in skilled trades and women in entrepreneurship programs. For our lowest-income seniors, we made the largest increase to the GIS, the Guaranteed in in Income Supplement, for the l in the last 25 years, and we're also working hard to protect the economy, jobs, and supporting families, which is just as important for women as it is in men, especially since we're 50 percent of the population. While we focus on better opportunities for women and girls, the opposition parties vote against everything we do for women and girls and want to raise taxes and put a carbon tax on everything. That will kill jobs and everything we have worked for towards making lives better for women and girls. Thank you. And now to Ryan Besson of the Libertarian Party. Well, as Peter mentioned, you know, the, the missing First Nations woman is definitely a huge issue. And again, as mentioned previously, I believe that, you know, we are spending too much time on, on focusing on sp uh, small petty crimes and victimless crimes like uh, marijuana. Um, I also believe that the best way for problems to be solved is for the problems to be solved by the people who are affected by it. So what we would have to do is, I, I, I think we should be looking at what can we do to put more tools in the hands of women to solve the problems and find solutions that work for them. You know, I, I, the most important thing is providing uh, the opportunities to have economic stability and have some kind of uh, income that allows them the, the disposable time and, and, and the means to come up with these solutions. Thank you. And again, just a reminder, we're talking about what each of the parties would do to make the lives of women better in Canada. Carol Dick of the Greens. I was a stay-at-home mom for seven years, and I have been trying to re-enter into the workforce. There is a huge untapped resource in Canada, which is our women. We are educated. We can do a lot. But the problem is with really expensive child care, after you have the second child, it is nearly impossible to go back to work. It is even harder if you've taken time off of work to then come back in. So what we really need to do is have a national child care policy. We need to also invest in programs that can help women re-enter the workforce after they have taken time off at home, doing one of the hardest jobs there is. The other thing that we need to do is close the gender gap. At the moment, women make 72 cents on the dollar, minority women make 64 cents on the dollar, and First Nations women make an abysmal 46 cents on the dollar. This is unacceptable. And we must make changes to bring women to a more equal status in the country and also increase their voice in government. We need to have more female MPs. So that marks the end of the debate portion of the program. Now we're going to hear closing statements from our candidates. They will each have 45 seconds to make their final pitch on way, why they should be the representative for London North Centre in Parliament. And we will start with Carol Dick of the Greens. 
The Green Party is not a one-issue party. Yes, the Green Party would like Canada to take concrete action to combat climate change, but at the same time, the Green Party offers a clear program to deal with poverty, homelessness, to close the gender gap, to enhance our health care, and to re-establish democratic values within our country. Our current leader would ask us to stay the course, but now is not the time. It is the time for new ideas and for bold ideas. In an era of rapid technological change and environmental uncertainties, we cannot hide behind old policies. At this point, I could bring a strong voice to London North Centre. I would work very hard, and I invite you to please look at the Green Party website to see the vision we have. Thank you very much. At this point, I should mention that we are working in reverse order from our opening statements. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, we will go to Ryan Besson of the Libertarian Party. Go ahead. Well, uh, I'm glad to have had the opportunity to be here. I'm very happy to be with all these candidates here. I think I can agree with the, every one of them on at least one aspect. I, I think the, the main goal here is to try and foster more discussion. You try and gauge the young disenfranchised voters and hopefully, you know, kind of see what we can do and how we can work together and, and work together on the issues we agree with to move forward. And I do think that every single person here has at least got some idea that will move Canada forward and I think that's what we should be focusing on is seeing where we can cooperate to move forward. Okay, thank you very much. Susan Troupe of the Conservatives. This election is about the economy and selecting a leader that we can respect and look up to. On one hand you have the strong proven leadership of Prime Minister Stephen Harper with a low tax plan to support families, seniors and to create jobs. The way to deal with global instability is by sticking with a plan that is working. On the other hand, we have opposition leaders with reckless high tax, high debt plans that will hurt our economy, kill jobs and leave you with less money in your pockets. The stakes are high and you have a choice. My name is Susan Truppe and on October 19th I am seeking re-election in London North Centre and I am asking for your vote. Thank you very much. Herman Gutierrez of the NDP. The one truth that we need to address is that there is a growing inequality that has weakened our middle class and reduced our contributions to our economic growth. The real change we need is a new democracy. And on October the 19th, it is in your hands to make it possible by voting for Herman Gutierrez, London North Centre, NDP. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now our final statement from Peter Fragascados of the Liberals. At the core of this election is a question. What kind of Canada do you want? For me, the focus has to be, yes, on social justice, but also on the economy. Uh, I mentioned my family before. Uh, my grandmother raised me in part. Uh, she taught me the values of social justice and of hard work. Uh, it hurts me to see people in this city who are not working. This city has so much untapped potential. Uh, we want to invest as a Liberal Party in infrastructure to get the economy going again to provide the middle class with tax cuts. With tax cuts, I want to emphasize that. We are not going to increase taxes on anyone except the 1% of people making $200,000, $500,000, $1 million a year. Mr. Mulcair and the NDP would continue to give checks on a monthly basis to millionaires. So would Harper. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And that marks the end of our candidates debate for London North Centre. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our candidates for being here today and to the journalists and London Youth Advisory Council members who have contributed questions. If you're interested in watching this debate again or seeing the other debates in our series, be sure to go to our local campaign page at rogerstv.com. Remember, we also want to hear from you on Twitter, get your thoughts about what you've seen, how you like the messages from each of our candidates here, and the hashtag to use as RTV local campaign. So once again, my name is Jess Brady. Please join us again next time as we put the local focus on the federal election.